Hello and welcome to Mostly Vintage Cameras. This is a Nikon, take a deep breath now, L35AWAD. You need the deep breath for two reasons. Firstly, the long and convoluted product name, and secondly, the fact that it's actually a waterproof camera down to three meters. In America, they went with the much snappier Action Touch. Not sure how I feel about that name. Anyway, it was launched in 1986. Uh, a lot of people believe it was a, an L35AF, a non-ruggedized camera, uh, essentially put into uh, an underwater housing. And it's sort of true, uh, and sort of not, but we'll look at that in some more detail later on. It's one of those cameras that just basically does what you expect it to do, and it works the way you expect it to work. So let's uh, go ahead and put some batteries in and we'll take a little tour of some of the camera functions. Now the battery cover, you will need a coin to open it. It's uh, obviously got a waterproof o-ring around the cover. There we go. Look at how thick that uh, battery cover is. Now it takes two AA batteries, uh, which will please a lot of people. Um, I, I think running compact cameras off the lithium style batteries is a great idea. Um, I seem to be in a minority on that point. It is important, and there's a warning in the battery compartment, not to use nickel cadmium rechargeables. So these are just regular alkalines. Pop the cover back on. Screw that down. Now Nikon were a little bit late to the automatic 35mm compact camera market and their first camera, the L35AF, um, was, was a perfectly nice camera, very well received. Uh, and that had a 35mm f2.8 lens, which this camera has as well. But on that first Nikon it was a 5 element lens in a kind of sonar configuration, which is a bit unusual because the sonar configuration doesn't really lend itself to the wider angle type lenses. With the AF, sorry, with the L35 AF2, uh, Nikon moved to a four element lens in three groups. And whilst I've never seen it written down anywhere, that suggests it was a, a, a more common Tessar style. And it's that four element lens that we have in this uh, L35 AW AD. Golly gosh, what a name. So on the front we've got a detachable lens cap. Unlike other cameras in the Nikon range, uh, or unlike the uh, AF2 at any rate, there's no built-in lens cover because you couldn't incorporate it into the waterproof uh, design of the camera. So we need to remove that. On the top plate we've got a nice chunky on-off switch. On off and self timer. One thing to bear in mind is if you have the lens cap on you can still see through the viewfinder and it is possible to take a photograph with the lens cap in place so just be aware of that. I suspect the sort of people who are using these are taking the lens cap off at the start of their surf session and they're not putting it back on again until they pack up and go home. One nice touch on the controls is when the camera's off, you can see there's this white bar extends all the way along the top, which gives you a, a visual indication that everything is in its most basic setting. Uh, you know straight away, just at a glance, that it's turned off, and now it's turned on. Now, you will notice Unusually for an automatic compact, it has a manual focus dial. The reason being, and I'm going to tell you now, I think this is just about the best of the waterproof automatic compacts that were made. Most manufacturers had one, a ruggedized camera, whether it was uh, just heavily ruggedized or actually waterproof. Uh, most of them, in fact I can't think of another one, that was actually able to disable the autofocus for underwater use. I think this is in part Nikon's experience making proper dive cameras 
in the form of the Calypso that later became the Nikonis range. And it's nice to see. I do take slight issue with the manual focus scale. And it's a bit, a bit, a bit pedantic. Generally, underwater lenses have a different focus scale to above water or lenses you'd use in air. And that's because light travels differently through water. I'm sure we've all put a straw in a glass of water and seen it looks magnified and it's seen it shoots off at an odd angle. Now Nikon do say you can use this manual focus scale uh, in water or on land, but they don't say whether it's calibrated for underwater or land use. It's probably set somewhere between the two. With the depth of field of the lens in use, it probably doesn't matter, but if you're just being super picky, you might pick them up on that. Not forgetting, of course, it actually has a manual scale for underwater use. It stops at three and a half meters, which is apparently 12 feet, because really underwater, you're not gonna be able to use it much beyond there. And if you are above three and a half meters, realistically, you're gonna be relying on the default infinity focus. Let's pop it back to autofocus. Now on the back, the AD part of this camera was an extra option that you could pay extra money for. And it was basically a small quartz clock uh, and you could choose to have the date or time stamped onto your photographs in kind of uh, slightly garish orange letters. Now if you were a building inspector or an architect going around looking at uh, work progress on sites where you need a organized camera, that might actually be quite a useful feature. If you weren't, you might have paid 20 or 30 pounds less and got the non-AD version. But the AD version was for some people quite handy. On the front of the camera, not much to see here. There is a flash control. It's not an automatically activated flash. And again, that relates to the sub-aqua or underwater facility. Keep saying this can be used down to three meters, but there are provisos to that. If you turn the flashing on in most seawater, what you'll see is a galaxy of little starlets of uh, dust motes and debris in the water lit up um, and you won't see anything. Trying to use a flash this close to the lens underwater, completely hopeless. So Nikon specifically say, do not use the flash underwater, which means in reality you can only use the camera in very clear water where it's very brightly lit. Most coastal waters around the UK probably aren't going to qualify. They're too churned up in the tides and all that sort of thing. But they couldn't incorporate an automatic flash in it because then it might fire underwater. And you'll see again, it's a big chunky button with a little lever uh, and clear markings. The grip the proud shutter button, the focus dial, and even the on-off switch are all Tonka toy sized so that you can operate this with gloves on. And all of that's terrific if you are snowboarding, if you are on your kayaking holiday and so forth. That's great. Where it becomes a bit more of an issue is when you get back from holiday and you go for a walk in the park with the family, you've now got to carry around this chunky camera that weighs over half a kilo because that's now your family camera. Uh, so it's great for when you need that extra protection, but maybe gets in the way a little bit when you don't. So an example of that is the self-timer. Perfectly normal self-timer. Press the button, 10 second countdown, little LED on the front. A lot of these sorts of cameras or a lot of automatic compacts will have um, a self-cancelling self-timer. This one, however, doesn't. So you do have to remember to turn it off. And again, that's to do with keeping water out of the housing. You can't have buttons that pop up automatically under spring tension and that sort of thing. Moving to the inside, we've got a, a chunky control for the film back. It does lock into place for safety. So there's a little notch on the side, you push the notch and twist uh, and you get to the first position, then the second position pops the film back open. So again that's a nice touch and 
uh, again reflects Nikon's experience in the underwater camera market. You don't want a film catcher can get knocked and open the camera back accidentally. The other unusual thing, comparing this to a regular automatic camera, or indeed most 35mm cameras, is the uh, pressure plate is hinged. Now I don't have a particularly good explanation as to why that is. However, with cameras that go underwater they experience pressure differentials and having a hinged uh, pressure plate like this rather than one mounted into the camera back in the normal way allows the film to stay in the film gate correctly under varying pressures. Why that is, uh, I'm afraid I have no better explanation. Now before we go any further, and looking at the idea of this being an automatic camera inside of a waterproof housing, we can see quite clearly there's a dividing line between the black of the, let's call it the gobbins of the camera, and the blue waterproof housing. And you remember how thick that battery compartment was? It's not just to make it waterproof, it's also because it's got to reach through this uh, two or three millimeters of plastic to get to the battery compartment that's actually inside of this housing. Anyway, we've got DX coded pins. I read that this runs from 50 ISO to 1600, but looking at these pins, I don't think that's true. I will put a note in the uh, description once I've uh, confirmed that. But it is DX coded. So we can take our test roll of film. Here we go. Pop it in there. Pop it in there. The leader only needs ooh, springy to extend to this orange marker. <laughs> Let's try that again. Got to remember to uh, put the pressure plate back. Turn it on, press the button, and it winds onto the first frame, and then you're ready to go. Take your photographs, a little cyclops eye, a little magnifying window for the frame counter, and that's pretty much it. Once you've taken your last photograph, it doesn't automatically rewind. There is a rewind lever here, which, there we go, you just push. There's no secondary button to stop you pushing it accidentally, but as you saw, it is quite difficult to uh, operate accidentally. And there's our film recovered. Terrific. Now this camera was sold in three colours. Uh, this one obviously is blue. There was also uh, sort of a, an emergency signal orange colour and a black. Now in the shop where I worked, uh, the black was the most popular and the blue was the second most popular. Uh, overall, the black and the orange were most popular. Where I worked was in a uh, genteel market town in the south of England uh, and people were perhaps a little more restrained. Uh, so the blue is a little more unusual. Some people feel that attracts a premium price. The data back certainly attracts a premium price. Like all of these... Um, better quality compact cameras. They are quite expensive to buy now and I've seen these selling today from £100 to as much unbelievably as £250 but typically they're in the £100 to £150 mark. I would note that on this blue version we can see patches of black showing through and on my desk here we are getting a little collection of blue paint flakes so I don't know how much uh, longer that's going to stay as a black base plate. Um, pretty nice camera, well, very nice camera in actual fact. It's very much in the in the better quality compact camera range. Most manufacturers, as I said before, did a weatherproof or waterproof camera. The Fuji HD1 and HD2, which I believe were known in America as the big job. Mm -hmm. uh, the Minolta Weathermatic, Olympus I think had some that were called the tough range I believe but pretty much everybody had a ruggedized camera but for my money this was 
the best of them certainly when people came in store looking for a, a, a underwater or organized camera this would be the one we would steer them towards because it really did uh, do the job that's that little bit better than some of the others there were um, a couple of accessories available for it one was the case which is this thing uh, and you actually had to pay extra for that uh, if you were interested this is called a CS-L35W um, it's just a soft case with a nylon lining nothing special I, I personally it's got the model number on the back I'm not personally particularly fond of Nikon compact camera cases of this period not of this one or the one for the L35 AFs um, but they do the job, I mean, it's something to, to put it in. You're not really going to be worried about getting this camera scratched though, and it doesn't really offer any extra protection over the uh, polycarbonate suit of armour it's already got. There was also a wide strap available which was fitted with a, um, a float, uh, a buoyancy aid, and that was called an AN-9. So it's worth noting that as is, this camera doesn't float quite important to know that if you are going to be using it uh, near deep water you might well want to put a flotation aid onto the strap to stop it disappearing to David Jones's locker anyway I've borrowed this camera from a uh, friend and former colleague and I've kept it for far too long so firstly my apologies to my friend uh, I should have returned it to you sooner but because I've borrowed this I haven't done two things Firstly, I haven't taken it underwater. Um, my friend was perfectly happy for me to do so, and indeed encouraged me to do so. But after 35 years, I'm not 100% convinced that the seals on this camera are still going to be as waterproof as they used to be. And if you are looking at a ruggedized camera, I might suggest that you view them as being more sturdy and splash resistant rather than underwater. If it was my own camera, I would certainly try it underwater, having said that. The other thing I haven't done is taken these screws out. There's one here, there's one here, and there's a third one somewhere, which may be this one, or there may be a screw under one of these labels. However, if you take the right number of screws out, this whole camera unit comes out and reveals its kind of inner workings and circuit board and that leaves you with a waterproof housing with a door lock so if you wanted to do that and I'm by no means suggesting you should you could perhaps devise a way of testing whether this was weatherproof or not without risking the delicate electronics inside again if it was my camera you would be watching a video of me taking a screwdriver to it it's not mine so I'm not going to no, I'm not. Um, I have taken some photographs, so that's... God, that really is flaking off, isn't it? That blue colourway. Now I'm going to start with the uh, the picture I like most on the whole roll of film, which is this um, tree branches. Just, just tree branches against the sky. Before we get into that, though, I would note perfectly clear edge markings, perfectly even spacings between the negatives, no hint of a light leak in this camera after 35 years. Not surprising given the thickness of the waterproof housing. But yeah, uh, the fact it's also winding on evenly just reflects the fact it's a, it's a better quality camera with um, more consistent operation. But coming back to these uh, tree branches, fairly dramatic sky here. I would point out, if we look in the uh, bottom right corner as you're looking at it, uh, even the, the twigs that are right up against the brightly lit sunlight, still perfectly sharp. Real uh, good retention of detail there. Quite uh, quite surprising in actual fact. What else do we have on this? Ah, here we go. This is, um, I'm going to turn it this way around. This is the Admiral Rodney Public House in uh, Woolerton Village. Um, if Nottingham has a posh suburb, Woolerton Village would be it quite late on a winter's day or uh, sun's very low in the sky good sharpness good retention of detail there's not really much else to say about it i would point out that uh, again as you're looking at this to the left of the roof you might see there's some weird little white lines and things 
I don't think that's anything to do with the camera. I think that's a drawing mark from uh, from the film processing. One of the reasons I think that is because it extends into the margin between the frames on some of these images. You'll see it on several of the images. Uh, so that's the animal Rodney. Again, a, a row of trees, a parade of trees. The sun's behind the camera position. Nice sharpness, nice contrast, control. Um, just the sort of performance you'd expect. And a good deal of sharpness all over. Um, now as we move down here, we've got the old stable block. Um, now these photographs were taken on Kodak Gold, which is about the cheapest colour negative film you can get these days. Cheap being a relative term. I've never been particularly fond of it, but it's, it's, a lot of people do like it, so I thought I'd try a roll through a camera. Not sure I'll be rushing to do it again. But looking at this uh, stable block, which I think is now a cafe in actual fact. Uh, very, very good sharpness, very good detail in the stonework and the clock face. Um, if you look at the um, space between the windows on the ground floor, you'll see there's a, a suggestion of a, of a blue uh, wash light. And this is uh, why I mentioned the film. There were very powerful floodlights with a, with a blue filter over illuminating the side of this building and yet on this Kodak gold you can only just make out there's any kind of uh, a wash there a color wash uh, at all uh, anyway moving on we've got the same issue with the film this is with the film not the i'm gonna go with this one in actual fact not the uh camera and the whole l ground floor of woolerton hall this is woolerton hall in nottingham uh, had uh, kind of purpley Christmas lights on at the time and yet they were very purple, very bright and yet you get only the faintest suggestion. So on the right hand side of the building where the bushes meet the ground floor you can see just a little bit of a purple fringe. It's not, uh, it's not chromatic aberration, it's all you can see of the, the brightly coloured lights. The Kodak Gold Works really well for oranges, browns, warm tones, uh, but the brighter colours uh, it doesn't seem to like very much. Uh, we'll have a quick look at this image. Just another parade of trees, well, the same parade of trees. I think that's um, actually, I was going to say, I think that gives you the, uh, the full story. But let's have a look at some of the drawbacks of automatic cameras. Now, this is a, a field. Um, the world's least exciting photograph and you can see it's a perfectly nice picture of a field good good exposure good sharpness you can see in the corners uh the, the corners are darkening a little a little bit of vignetting that's to be expected with these sorts of cameras if you look at a 35mm lens for a, an SLR or mirrorless camera the, the lens is bigger than these entire cameras are so you can't expect corner to corner illumination to be perfect however if we want to move the camera up a little bit and include more of the sky we get this classic problem with automatic exposure cameras the camera exposes for the sky which looks great and we get this horrible silhouette of a landscape and you need to bear that in mind when you're taking that type of photograph uh, there is a focus lock which i didn't use here and perhaps should have done so um for some reason i wanted to photograph this this branch uh, and the moss that's on it, but um, uh, it does have a pre-focus, um, which I just completely forgot about. And on that note, I think that uh, wraps up the Nikon Deep Breath L35AW-AD. Very nice camera, uh, certainly well worth considering if you want a ruggedized automatic film camera for your next ski holiday. If you don't need the ruggedization, then maybe go for the L35 uh, AF or the L35 AF2 or 3 or, or any of the better quality um, automatic compact cameras. That's a Fuji, uh, no it's not, that's a Minolta AFS and a Fuji DL200. The original SureShot, SureShot Mark II, SureShot Supreme from Canon. Uh, but if you do like the idea of a chunky camera or indeed a blue camera then um for my money this is uh, as good as they get uh, and, that, and it is very good indeed anyway 
I hope somebody's found that of interest or use. Thank you for watching. I do appreciate it and do have a good day. All the best.